Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Moses and you are listening to the AHP Leader podcast. This podcast is a podcast series special on breaking disability barriers and this one in particular is dedicated to guide dogs and assistant dogs and what they mean to our wonderful panel and you may recognize some of these lovely faces today. So I'm going to ask each of the panel members to introduce themselves and I'd also like them to introduce their guide dogs as well because we're going to be seeing some lovely photographs. So Carrie, over to you first. Yes, my name's Carrie. Um, I'm a physiotherapist and um, my guide dog, she's called Amber and she's six years old. She's my first guide dog I've had. Thanks, Carrie. Vicky. Hi, my name's Vicky. I'm a physiotherapy manager and I have a guide dog, Houston, and Houston is my fifth guide dog, though I still have my retired guide dog, Zeke, with us as well. And that's Houston in the background, isn't it, with lovely daffodils. It's incredible. It looks amazing, Vicky. <laughs> and Mandy. Yeah, hi, I'm Mandy Pike. Um, I'm currently a physiotherapy lecturer at University of Winchester. Um, and I have a lovely Fable, who's my first guide dog. She is just turned seven, so I've had her just over five years. Thank you so much. Now, to kick off, because the demand to see photographs of the guide dogs after the last podcast was just absolutely crazy. So hopefully this is going to work. If I share my screen now, hopefully... Um, oh, if I just go back a second. Now, hopefully you can all see this. So this first picture is of Houston underneath the Houston sign. And as you can see, what a gorgeous, gorgeous, well-behaved dog. Now, maybe it wasn't always that way. I'm sure Vicky will tell us that in a moment. This is the screen, um, the photograph behind Vicky's screen at the moment with the daffodils. There's them actually working. Um, it looks like a church or a cathedral um, you're in, Vicky, but he's I think it's you. the Houses of Parliament. West oh, Houses of Parliament. Absolutely. Absolutely brilliant. And um, Houston there is just gazing into your eyes, looking absolutely gorgeous. You must have thought a treat was coming in his direction, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> definitely um now the next picture um again i hope you can all see this um is houston who he seems to be having a little bit of playtime with a cuddly toy um, um probably rolling on his back he, he <laughs> flicks the toy he'll pass it from paw to paw um but also it's how many toys he can get in his mouth at one time to greet somebody at the front door or or three toys in a shoe. Absolutely gorgeous. And I think it's it shows the power of work and play, doesn't it? And how happy guide dogs and assistant dogs um, can be part of the family. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. And this this next picture is exactly that. I think one, two, three toys. Um, and certainly having like, two Labradors myself, I know that very well. Um, my ginger dog, she can fit two tennis balls, two sticks and one toy in her mouth. Um, yeah, so I must admit during lockdown and working from home, because he's working not as much as he would do, would be walking all around the hospital, going and seeing different teams. Uh, and obviously I'm not quite as entertaining. So, um, uh, so I'm kind <laughs> of getting him to do other things, like I'm teaching him to clear up after himself and gather up all of his own toys so that we can then put them in the basket. Um, and training him to bring me my shoes because he loves picking shoes up and moving them around the house. So I thought, okay, well, let's see if I can get him to bring them back to me, especially when I need to put them on. So it's, it's called, yeah, MBQ Bolt on Competences. We're extending his repertoire. I just am absolutely incredible, Vicky. Um, thank you for that. Now, moving on to the beautiful Amber here. So, this is a picture of Amber. It's a very outdoor, lovely place with a little waterfall. And 
also at the beach there, <laughs> looking absolutely gorgeous. Um, typical Labrador for anyone that's had Labrador in that wet cold. Um, this is her again in another puddle. Carrie, typical Labrador yeah. loves water. It's amazing she's ever clean, really. <laughs> and you know, we were just talking when we were, um, when you guys were looking for photographs, and you said it's very rare you'll take any when guide dogs are working. So um, it's mm -hmm. nice to have the other side of the pictures as well. And that's uh, having some downtime by the looks of it as well. Action shot, sure, yeah. And I, I love this one. This is very much part of the family, um, isn't she? With your two boys there. Yeah, she's she's completely, she, she lives for them. She's so excited to see them. And that was one of the things I think when um, they paired her to me was that, it, you know, she had to be a dog that was good with kids. And um, yeah, she's just the best, bless her. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I've just stopped my sharing my screen now. So um, Mandy is just, we're just going to give Mandy a second and she will um, start sharing her screen. And she actually has some videos if they work. Now we did have a little bit of a shock when we trialed this before because there, there was um, <laughs> other videos that popped up. But yeah we won't do that one what I thought I might do is just show you the photos first have I shared my screen though yes hey excellent and, and is it big enough can everyone see yes perfect so the first um it's a little collage basically I thought I'd just show a pictures of Fable in current job which is probably the most perfect guide dog setup I've had in since I've had her really um, so that top left, you can see a picture of my desk uh, with her harness hanging on the wall behind. She's got space for a bed. There is a tether point um, if I needed to tether her, but I, I don't usually at the moment at work. Um, water bowl down there as well. And she's got some toys, which I think is quite important at work. <laughs> Um, and then also the, at the bottom, you can see her in our practical room. So when we're teaching the students practical uh, sessions, she is most definitely tethered at that point because I think there could be chaos otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and also in the lecture theatre, um, you can see her just underneath the screen. So she's tethered at the front and I'm sure that they look at her more than they do the screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then there's just a few more, I guess, of... Um, they were doing a little bit of um, work for the CSP <laughs> um, at various events um, and me at work clinically. And I don't think, um, I went to ARC a couple of years ago, um, which is the bottom left photo there. And that was me um, speaking on stage uh, for one of the motions around um, disability inclusion, etc. And I think I look back at that and I would never have done that pre-fable mostly because I wouldn't have been able to see my way from the back of a large sort of auditorium to the front, up the steps onto the stage without causing a huge embarrassment. So that's the kind of thing, I guess, that um, she's done for me, is enabling me to do things like that. And given that, uh, oh, that's just a few more adventures that we've been on. London Underground is always interesting with a guide dog when they're not escalator trained. Uh, so you have to get some assistance to get them to stop the escalators or take you down the little back staircases. Um, and then I thought I'd just finish with a, given that everyone else's dogs had playtime. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that right there with lots of other guide dogs uh, just jumping on each other in the water and fading from green. Uh, so if I go to... Oh, that hopefully that stopped sharing has that done it yeah that stopped sharing amazing um that's fantastic thank you so much so i hope we've got all of the gay dog labrador love just embedded now throughout this throughout this chat and i wonder i know you guys aren't guide dog experts by the way but i thought what would be really nice is just a little bit of background about like what makes a good guide dog how does a guide dog even begin its life as a guide dog and within that talking about particular breeds now Vicky I know you you mentioned at the beginning you've had five 
mm. guide dogs. Do you want to talk us through, you know, where your journey starts with being a guide dog owner and also where the dog's journey starts? So, um, so guide dogs are, are hugely dependent and really appreciative of puppy walkers. So as a six week old puppy, the, um, they go back into the guide dog assessment to check for um, uh, you know, if there's any, any uh, particular issues that they can pick up uh, around the dog. So they've been, been doing it for so long now that it's all very uh, scientific and they can pick out dogs that are going to struggle, maybe very noise aware or noise shy um, or, or very sensitive. Um, so puppies that kind of pass their first exams, if you like, then get placed with a puppy walker for uh, 12 to 14 months. And it's the puppy walker who does all the, the basic obedience training to getting the dogs to sit, to lie down, uh, to stop at curves, uh, to behave on the lead, um, to socialize with other dogs and become very familiar within, if you can expose a, a a puppy within the first 14 weeks to things they don't have any anxiety related to new things it's just oh wow what's that whereas a, a five-month-old dog will start to oh I haven't seen that before um, so they really try and expose the puppies to uh, as much as they possibly can um, and I know COVID you know guide dogs have tried to keep this going during COVID and talking to um, uh, the, the Southwest puppy manager, um, and she was sharing, um, Joe, Joe was, uh, Joe was sharing with me that uh, she was doing a Zoom puppy class. 30 puppies and their owners on Zoom scattered across the Southwest. Uh, and she was saying they did musical sit. So when she stopped the music, the you know the dogs that the, the owners the, couldn't get their puppies to sit then were getting kicked out and the winner was the puppy that sat the quickest. I just thought that was <laughs> so ingenious and very very brave. Um, but um, but obviously get into that point where they you know a, a dog is able to reliably navigate around obstacles um, and people. Uh, find a, a, a chair um, you know, really important, um, find an empty chair even more important, um, uh, be able to take you to the curb and uh, get you across the road, navigate on a railway station, you know there's nothing you know, more hazardous than a platform with a sheer drop and then a, a speeding train coming in, especially one with you know, platforms on both sides. So being able to have that confidence and for you to have that confidence in the dog um, and get that dog to that, that stage. You know, we're grateful for so many different people, the, the puppy walkers, the puppy managers, the trainers, um, the advanced trainers, um, you know, that, that support that dog's journey before they then you know, arrive with you. That in it's <laughs> a really interesting time, isn't it? That matching process they call it um and i can remember getting a phone call from um and out you were asked if you would you would train out of area um and i i was really lucky i wasn't on the waiting list for too long i had a phone call from uh the reading team to say we think we've got a match for you she's a black labrador she's fast and needs a firm hand and i wasn't quite sure what that said about me <laughs> Um, but I do think they get that so right. Like, it's incredible how dogs are matched, I think, with people. It is, it's definitely a bit of magic, I think. No, and I, I think as well... I think it's almost like um, a dating process. <laughs> Sorry, I said I think it's almost like a dating process. Like, it's, it's your match, and then you get the phone call, say, oh, well, we've matched you. And they look at, like, different things. Like, so for Amber, like, they looked at my pace, they look at your height... Um, like she had to be good with kids she had to be good at traveling she had to be good with absolutely no routine because we I was studying at the time so it wasn't a classic like nine to five you know routine and, and stuff like that and yeah it's, it's amazing it's amazing how right they yeah they get it it's brilliant and they are so adaptable aren't they like you know you look at 
look at the jobs I've had in the five years that I've had Fable, which probably represents the confidence she's given me to try and do new things in terms of my career. So when I got her, I was working in a, a trust that I'd worked in for 10 years doing the same job. Um, and so she, she fitted into like a clinical outpatients department. Then I got a job with Health Education England, traveling across Wessex, looking at primary care workforce development. So there was a huge amount of travel. Um, and then I had a job in commissioning, which was an office-based job. And then I went back to do a bit of clinical work and now at the university and then COVID. And you think, how do these dogs just adapt so amazingly to everything you throw at them? Crazy. Definitely. And as being a dog owner, a pet owner, I can't even begin to imagine how people would start to train these mm. puppies. I think it takes a lot of, like you just mentioned, Vicky, a lot of dedication on the puppy walkers and people who just invest that time in getting it right from well from birth really isn't it the start when they're very young and some people I remember having a conversation with this someone about this once and they said oh they thought it was quite cruel because it was quite regimented mm -hmm. and it takes away their childhood you know their puppyhood and I thought well you know working dogs if you think some some breeds actually just have it in them you we talk about retrievers or we talk about collies and actually they're much happier when they're task orientated oh, yeah. or they have jobs to do or it's in their nature to kind of please and do things for you know I don't like the word master but that's essentially what it is and Vicky I know you mentioned about um breeds for this reason didn't you in different types of of guide dogs yes so, um, I mean, that, that, you know, that actually, you know, you're making a dog work. I think one of the, the, the loveliest things for me, uh, and yes, I've had five guide dogs and I, it's hard work, that swap over um, point. You, you know, you, you go from uh, a very elderly dog who is now quite slow in walking, slow in making their decisions, um, you know, and I, yeah, I was trying to warn everybody at work, um, and actually they were really, you know, my colleagues were trying to cover for me and cover the fact that um, uh, that my guide dog wasn't really uh, able anymore to do, you know, to work terribly well. So everybody really was was supporting him, and you know, and I don't think people realise that actually it can take quite a uh, quite a long time to get rematched in a new dog generally you know 12 months to maybe even two years from when your, your dog starts to struggle to actually uh, having uh, having a replacement and you kind of go from a dog that's walking very 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 slowly but kind of in the right direction to a new young dog that's working you know, that's walking very very fast in the wrong direction and you've kind of got to suddenly manage that that switch over um, but yes, different different breeds. Labradors really want to please. So the the two Labradors I've had have really tuned in to me, uh, you know, uh, where I'm going and, and want to get me there as fast as possible. Yes, yes, we can do this. We can do this absolutely. Um, but would uh, found it more difficult, say, in a corridor with lots of similar doors, um, uh, especially you know, in hospital settings. Um, you know, oh gosh, which 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 door is it? It's so brilliant getting me to the corridor, but then you know maybe needing a, a little bit more support as to finding the right door. Whereas uh, the retrievers and and Houston, my latest, my my mischievous Houston, um, you know, uh, getting there is is a little bit more of an effort. You know, he'll he'll get me there, but it's oh we haven't been down that corridor yet, and oh what's going on over there? Oh gosh, no, she really does want to continue. All right, no, no, I'll I'll focus. But then having got to the corridor, he'll take me straight to the door that I go to most often. Um, yeah, absolutely amazing, and you know that plonk me right by the door handle. And if it's not that room, and actually this time it's a meeting, and it's it's on the other side, two doors down. And I say, oh, yeah, brilliant. But no, find the next one without any fuss or concern. It's okay, oh, what's the door she goes to? Second most option. Oh, it's this one over here. Um, so that, that processing and analyzing and remembering the spot, you can't beat a retriever 
but wanting to please, you can't beat a Labrador. Mm -hmm. That's just incredible. Thank you, Ricky. Oh, there's so many questions I want to ask from then, but I'll put a part of them until later. Um, Carrie, you mentioned it when we're having the pre-chat about you may be doing some re research or you've been looking into different foods and the science maybe behind it. Yeah, so um, I'm doing a uh, master's at the moment in veterinary physiotherapy or, well, trying to do a master's in veterinary physiotherapy. Um, but uh, yeah, and I've been hoping, well, hopefully um, doing a collaboration with Guide Dogs um, next year as a research project, potentially. Um, but what it is, is yeah, it's looking, um, looking at um, canine obesity, really. And what they found is um, that with regards to Labrador, um, Labrador retrievers, that there is actually um, a like, mutation of a gene that makes them um, more hungry and more food driven. Um, and there's been a particular um, paper that actually found that that was more prevalent in um, dogs selected to be guide dog breeding stock. Um, so, yeah, so they, they think that there's that potential predisposition. And um, I don't know about everyone else's guide dog, but my guide dog, Amber, she's such a foodie. Like, she's amazing, but it's the food. That's when she lets herself down. <laughs> Bless that. <laughs> They are also, aren't they, at the moment? There's quite a, there's a few German Shepherd guide dogs out there as well. I yeah. think it's just interesting because people don't expect that so much. I think they see um, Shepherds more as that kind of police dog rather than guide dogs, but there's definitely a few of them to be looking out for and they seem to be working really well. And they've started doing Labradoodles well, yeah. as well. Yeah, and Retriever yeah. Shepherd Crosses, I think, as well. Retriever Shepherd mm. crosses by my um, Houston's yeah. Poppy Walker, who uh, we, we visit regularly. She has looked after a, a Shepherd Retriever puppy. And I did say, well, why not a, a Shepherd Labrador? And she said, oh, no, you need the Retriever to calm the Shepherd down. The Labrador would just hyper the, the <laughs> Shepherd. But I think that must be a lovely combination, a, a Shepherd um, Retriever. Absolutely. And it, it brings me back to service dogs because the first service dogs in the, must be in the First World War, were German mm. Shepherds. For that reason, for their loyalty, I think for their strength as well and their resilience and their intelligence. Because that's the thing with a Labrador sometimes, don't they? They, they lack that common sense sometimes. Um, the Retriever, I think, has more, a bit more common sense. But yeah, the, like you said, Vicky, that combination of the Shepherd. Mm. Um, with a retriever or potentially Labrador and I think in some other countries as well so America and um, Israel of uh, uh, certain European countries you'll see a shepherd used much more commonly than a Labrador or a Labrador retriever um, it's fascinating isn't it and I, I think a lot of it is like is down to breeding like you said and is about just to the phenotype of the dog I suppose and their inherent behaviours but also maybe just typical about the role play or about how, you know, how these dogs can be trained. I don't know. And maybe is it anything even to do with the fur? Because they're all quite short haired and the size of them, because obviously you couldn't have a tiny little dog being yeah. a gay dog. I mean, people would just trip over it. I think as well, it's... um. You know, there's all this lovely, it's, it's lovely, It's a, she's amazing, but you know, it, it, it's really hard work as well, which I think is the other bit to be, to be aware of really, you know, that it's hard work for puppy walkers and trainers and boarders and all those amazing volunteers and staff at Guide Dogs to get them to that point. But then once you get this, this living thing, you know, again, I can remember that moment when Fable was delivered to me with enough things to keep her alive for 24 hours was how it felt. And, <laughs> and I had no idea what I was doing at all. Um, and you have a month of intensive training. Usually it's two weeks in a hotel, like residential. Mine wasn't, mine was at home. And then another two weeks doing your regular routes, getting to work, etc. And you know, I think it took six months to a year mm -hmm. before you really start to go. Do you know what? This is working. This is this is really good. And then it takes a lot of investment in terms of 
continuing that work you know you can't let things slip you have to keep rewarding you have to keep training you have to keep keep on top of that I think and particularly with that kind of traffic work and um you just can't let for me particularly because my eyesight varies on with different weather conditions like in the sunlight I have virtually nothing useful at all and on a cloudy day I'm not bad but Fable needs to learn to adapt to that in me as well so I think it's it's it is it's a commitment and it isn't right for everybody I think that's the other the really important thing to say as well oh yeah like the comment you made in the pre-chat about <laughs> Can I say it when he said, I don't even know if I like dogs. I don't know if I, I'll even want it. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm such a dog person. I would be like. When I first, when I first went on the list to guide, I didn't really know. I think back in the day when I was younger, um, needing to be have, have no useful vision at all was part of the criteria. So I'd never really thought about it before. And I suppose I'd never really wanted to be that open about my disability, which is what we were talking about last time, wasn't it? But um, I just remember thinking, oh, I put myself on the waiting list. I don't even know. I don't even know if I like dogs. I've never had them in my life. I don't think it took long before she uh, stole my heart, though. <laughs> so that, that brings us on to the next point, which is um, so the, a guide dog enters your life. Now, are they your working companion? Are they your assistant dog first? Are they part of the family first? Like, how do they enter your world? Um, Carrie, if I can come to you first, because obviously you um, have children and obviously have a, a family life. Um, how did you approach it? Because, um, you know, Amber's your first guide dog. Yes, yeah, so I suppose with Ams, um, I think she like the line I always say about her is she works hard and she plays hard like and her ability to switch is amazing like it, it's exceptional like as soon as she gets her harness on she's like yes this is this is me now I am working and then as soon as she comes back and gets the harness off and she's running all over the sofa and wrestling with the kids and stuff you wouldn't you wouldn't even know that she was a trained guide dog and like some of those photos down at the beach, I can remember like one day I took her down at the beach, whipped her harness off and she just took off across the beach. And I thought, oh my God, I don't even know if she's going to come back. Mm -hmm. And it was awful because I was like, she's supposed to be this highly trained dog and you're stood there like holding her harness and she just goes absolutely nuts. But I think it's, it's critical for her to have that time. And there's something so lovely about seeing it as well. Um, and I know like when um, we were working um, like clinically in the hospital, um, we would take her out on our lunch break and some of my colleagues, they'd actually ask if they could come out just because they wanted to just see her go crazy and run around like a loon, like throughout the field and make a fuss of her and that. And then as soon as she got her harness back on and we were walking back into the hospital, she clicks back into that. This is me now. I'm nice and calm. I don't talk to anyone, people don't make a fuss of me. And she just, yeah, their ability to switch amazes me. Like, yeah, every time. Yeah. Thank you. And I think we need the public that, you know, what one of the, the uh, pieces of information for the public is, yeah, a guide dog is good at doing that. And part of that is them not getting attention and distraction when they're in harness and particularly when the handle is up and if a, if a dog did get a lot of attention and patting and you know then they'd, they'd lose that oh I'm in harness and and I I work now and everybody will ignore me um, you know so that's where the public can really really help if you know by understanding that and you know and 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 we love the public support and when the, you know, the handle's down and the dog's resting, absolutely. You know, we, we love to share our dogs with, with the public, but when the handle is up and the dog is working, then uh, uh, in order to keep their understanding that they're doing something different in harness and also to keep uh, the guide dog owner safe, then actually not trying to get their attention and not making a fuss of them and certainly not calling them because if a guide dog's attention is on a member of the public their attention isn't on the person that they're working for 
and our intention isn't on keeping that person safe. And as an owner, I always feel really mean saying to people, can you not touch her? Can you not talk to her? And then, and then I feel terrible because I, I'm asked, and I, and I really, really appreciate the public support. And obviously, like we said, it's it's a charity. It's you know, it's completely charity funded. And I'm, and I'm so grateful. And I'm always so conscious of actually people who talk to us. They might be donating and things like that. And I'm more than happy to talk to people. More than happy to educate. But you feel awful saying to someone, "Look, can you can you not stroke my dog?" I can remember I was in Lidl one day um, and Amber, I was like looking at trying to find a yogurt and um, Amber started pulling at me and I turned around and there was a lady on her hands and knees in the middle of Lidl fussing Amber's face and I just went oh can you not do that please she is a guide dog and the woman went oh I didn't realize and stropped off and I was well she's wearing all her guide dog gear that specifically says don't distract me we are in the middle of a supermarket. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't know how you could make it clearer that she was working. <laughs> I've, um, I've had that uh, walking, trying to cross a road, really busy road outside a hospital, with somebody on the other side calling the dog across the road to come across, and you just think, thank goodness she didn't do anything. But mm. that's really, what? Why? <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 come and help me by all means ask me if I need some help but don't call my dog while you're calling her into traffic I think that's a really good point though because I was thinking back to this before I was preparing for the podcast and I was thinking how do I know not to approach a guide dog and I think it's probably because I've been told at quite a young age because I'm such a dog like I don't have children so dogs are everything for me so I think I've just been obsessed. So if I was to see, and I vividly remember as a younger person being, I said, can I, can I stroke your dog? And they said, no, you can't, they're working. And I says, okay. And I just remember leaving feeling, oh God, I really wanted to stroke that dog. But then I was really, I, I, just, I just felt sad. And I didn't know why I felt sad because it was, it's not about me, mm -hmm. is it? <laughs> about a dog that's working and the person that needs the dog. So Vicky, how do people, I mean, is it just about people, I suppose, having common sense, like Harry says, because it's now, do not disturb me, I am working, I am a guide dog. Or actually, do you, does there just need to be more education around this? Um, I, do you think? I think the message is out there and, um, and it's amazing how many times I, you know, I'll have somebody, oh, I know I'm not supposed to, but can I? Um, and I just, yeah, generally, yeah, I say, oh, I actually know, if, yeah, I'd prefer if you didn't, but thank you very much for asking. Thank you very much for, you know, for, for being aware. Um, and, and I don't think, I think people, if people really thought about what the guide dog is doing, you know, that you are absolutely dependent on the dog. So if, if the dog's being called enticed food uh, somewhere, you know, you're stuck on the other end of that, uh, being, being you know, you know, guided across the room. Um, you know, and it is about safety. You know, in a shop, you could crash into things. You could swing round um, and hit things on the shelf. The person would be mortified that they'd caused that. Um, I'm sure. So I, I think it's just that, you know, that, that they act before they think. Um, and it's that understanding. I think also, you know, going back to Amanda's point, crossing the road, uh, people um, uh, believe that, that the, you know, that, that guide dogs are amazing. Guide dogs are absolutely amazing, but they have the mental age of a three-year-old. You know, and how many people would ask a three-year-old to decide when to cross the road? So that crossing the road, not just the dog is concentrating really hard to not get things wrong. You are concentrating really hard to try and hear, you know, is there traffic there? Is there a cyclist? Am I able to cross? Because actually it is you crossing the road, you know. So, so actually if you do see a guide dog owner uh, crossing the road, you know, go and offer 
uh, them help, you know, and say, you know, are, are you okay? Or would you like a hand? Um, don't grab them and try and cross the road with them, whether they want to go across or not. Um, you know, it's about asking um, again. And, and certainly I can remember being stood on the side of the road, really concentrating. It was a difficult road and I could hear a conversation going on sort of 10 feet down the road to two older ladies. And they were saying, oh, well, we'll, we'll go across the road when the guide dog goes. And I'm thinking, oh, no, not only am I likely to get myself killed and my guide dog killed, I'm now going to get two complete strangers killed at the same time. Whereas actually they should have been coming and offering me, me help. So that, that's a really good point. Um, sorry, Mandy, just to come in there. Um, so if, if there is someone with a guide dog and they are struggling to cross a road, do you approach the person and say, would you like some assistance? Or is that, is that the right thing to do? Everyone seems to be nodding. Completely. <laughs> And what would happen at that point is that they, if they came to your right hand side, you would drop the handle of the harness, which means the guide dog knows it's no longer in control of that situation. And then you would take the elbow of the person that's guiding you across the road. Yeah. Um, rather than them grabbing you, it's a case of us kind of taking the elbow or shoulder, whichever of the person on the right hand side and then the dog just is on its lead rather than harness at that point. And offers of help are always appreciated. You, you never, I don't think, well, I can speak for me, you're never going to offend me by asking if you can help me cross the road. Yeah. Like that, there's no offence to be taken there. You know, it's, it's a nice thing to offer to help people. And I guess that kind of, I can do the video of Fable doing some traffic work if you want me to, uh, while I talk about it. Do you want me to try and do that, Rachel? Yeah, go on, that would be good. Let me see, yes. And Vicky, I think, while you're doing that, Mandy, um, Vicky mentioned about food, and that just brought me back to a friend. She wasn't a close friend, but um, they were a guide dog owner, and they told me a story about how they were waiting for someone outside of a Greg's or something and some random stranger just fed their dog this mm. sausage roll mm. and um and they didn't realize until you know the harness the harness was up they were working and um they didn't realize till this dog had like this labrador had lapped up this sausage roll and uh, about 30 minutes later or so it just they were in the chemist and this dog was just violently sick everywhere and of course they were like yeah. they couldn't clean it up they couldn't really see it it was just this whole awful thing and I was just thinking in my head why on earth but I'm a dog owner and I would never feed a dog because you know, that mm, yeah. happen quite frequently but why would anyone do that have you ever experienced that where random strangers would just mm -hmm. give the dog food absolutely and, and what oh, they don't really? realise is it's not even just that action that's the issue. It's the fact that then when your guide dog is walking past somebody, which might be a child, stood there waving a sausage roll around, you know, the dog is going to think, oh, brilliant, somebody else is offering me a sausage roll. And, you know, may well then, you know, go to try and take the sausage roll out of the hand. So it, it impacts on that dog's behaviour. That's so true. I never even thought of that. It's a classic when um, it, I'm gent totally stereotyping here, but it tends to be older men on our dog walks that always have dog treats in their pockets. So my black mm -hmm. Labrador, who's you know, 12, he will all like every older man he sees, he like gallops over and like is licking furiously the pocket because he thinks he associates it with every man's going to give him a treat out of his pocket. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's embarrassing. Yeah. But you're, you're right, I wouldn't even have conceptualised that with a guide dog if you're waiting outside, especially if because their sense of smell is so good. You know, they, they smell familiar things, don't they? Um, and then that's a learned response. I wouldn't have even thought that, so you're so right. So for everyone listening, never feed a guide dog. Mm -hmm. And never, don't, don't ask, don't even say, can your dog have a treat? The answer is going to be no. <laughs> no, thank you. You're undoing their training. Mm -hmm. yeah. what that action is doing it's undoing their training thank you mandy how are you getting on yeah okay. let me see if i can share i thought i had but i think it flicks back doesn't it um oh there we go okay so uh can you see that slide yep 
hopefully that will just play. And what I'll just talk you through it. Can you still hear me okay? Um, basically what you're seeing is Faber working along a busy road. Um, and she comes to a, a yeah, you know, And she's indicated yeah. my friend. I ask her now. Forward. To go forward, because I think the road's yeah. clear. However, she I've missed it. So that's oh, look at her face. Face. Um, so that's an example of the traffic work. So the guide dog doesn't um, decide to cross the road. The owner decides when it's safe to cross the road. But the thing is, the owner gets it wrong sometimes, just like I did then. Um, that was far traffic turning right. It was a noisy road and I hadn't heard the change in the engine of the car approaching to turn right. So it asked her to go forwards and she refused, which is their kind of traffic work training. She does that, they do it with bikes as well, which is even more impressive because yeah. you can't hear them, can you? <laughs> it's unbelievable, honestly, it, it's just incredible. So, um, wow, I'm conscious of time. Been chatting for about 40 minutes, can you believe another one? Um, so I want to move into the workplace and we've seen, um, well, Mandy, you've already touched on this a little bit, but um, maybe just share some um, thoughts or experiences about why guide dogs and assistant dogs are absolutely vital in the workplace. I mean, by law, by under the Equality Act, we have to um, allow dogs into all workplaces on public transport in taxis um and but I know there can be limitations with that and Carrie I don't know if you want to start because you've had some challenges um taking Amber into certain parts of the hospital even though there was very clear guidance very clear information written yeah um so I said uh I was working in the hospital um and I'd been called to see a pediatric patient and um, me and Amber went over to go onto the pediatric ward um and the um ward sister um asked us to leave and said that Amber wasn't wasn't allowed on the ward um and I did say well I've got this 48 page very thorough risk assessment that actually says she's allowed everywhere in the hospital I can email it to you if you like and it really shouldn't be a problem um and no and she just stood there in the middle of quite a busy ward and this had obviously attracted some attention and she said no she said you just need to leave um and I, I like to think of myself as quite um outgoing um but when when some when you do get an access refusal or somebody makes you feel like that it really it really knocks the wind out of your sails um and it really I think it, it it's just it's really upsetting um and and although you know obviously it's about the dog they are a part of us and they're our mobility aid and you know if if I had rocked onto the ward in a wheelchair I can't imagine her saying the same thing. Um, and I think they're the parallels that we need to draw. So um, before my first job, I was asked um, if I could start without Amber because they hadn't managed to iron out all the creases. Um, and that was the analogy I used. I said, well, look, you know, if, if I was coming in tomorrow in a wheelchair, would we still be having this conversation? Um, and, and I think, yeah, I think, it's lovely it's lovely that they're dogs and they're amazing but they are our mobility aid and they are our independence and and I think that it needs to be respected. I think it's really important as well isn't it that Equality Act um, is not about allowing or refusing access for a dog it's about refusing access to a person who is visually impaired. I think that's really important you know People say the dog can't come in, but what you're actually doing is refusing access to me rather than the dog. And I think for me, because um, I'm visually impaired, so I have got some useful sight left, I think there's a common misconception that you have to be completely blind to have a guide dog. So because I have some useful vision, people will assume that I can do without her or I'm potentially training her or she's not a real guide dog or... And, and so we, we we face a lot of barriers like that and I find I, I end up having to justify 
the fact that I have got useful vision left, um, which which again, it's, it's just a common misconception, which I think, yeah, would be great if people could be more aware that actually there is a spectrum of sight and everybody everybody has different different sight. Oh, absolutely. And some of this is, I remember from one of the other disability podcasts that Raz was talking about um, anticipatory um, planning. So what we often do is wait for someone with a disability or someone who may require a mobility aid or a guide dog or, you know, we wait for that to happen. So we're really not inclusive at all. And then to some degree or a lot of degree, I don't know what your experience is, that the person who needs a reasonable adjustment um, is the barrier, they're the problem. And really it's not, it's a system that's a problem because we should, if we, if we work in truly inclusive systems and organisations, this wouldn't really, it would be implementing the reasonable adjustment. It wouldn't be working out what the barrier is, then identifying why it causes the problem, then addressing or finding the solution for that problem then trying to fund that solution to the problem so and then people coming up with reasons why they shouldn't do that <laughs> so there's so many multiple stages isn't there to allow what is a reasonable adjustment or like you said Mandy accessed for me to allow me to be included um what are people's thoughts on that I mean Vicky you had some you give some amazing examples of how Houston and I'm sure your other guide dogs have been able to navigate around a hospital. They, act, they actually increase your independence, don't they? Because you're not dependent on a member of staff or a colleague or, or someone else in the workplace. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I, I love the working relationship. I mean, I love seeing Houston running around and, and in the park and being off lead. I love seeing them off lead. But also I, I love that working relationship and that finding out how to give him the support and the encouragement that he needs to then be able to literally, you know, and he is literally my eyes. So, um, yeah, I don't have any useful uh, vision. So, so, yeah, I will rest my hand on the top of his head. You know, when I'm say waiting to go into a room for a meeting, you know, and I can see, I can feel him looking around, I can feel his ears twitching, and I can pick up from him you know, what's you know, what's going on around me. It's an image I'm really comfortable with, and everybody's very different. Um, so, uh, so I find the image of a guide dog that that getting independence through maximizing a working relationship actually resonates for me and makes me feel less disabled. I don't feel disabled. I've just got to, you know, I just do things. Um, that I might, you know, I just, uh, my adaptation is uh, working as one with a guide dog. And as you, you, you know, and, and um, the others will, will do this, you weave your way around through people, around obstacles and, you know, it's, it's a little bit like dancing, you know, you're dancing together. So after that, it does take 12 months and it does take hard work where you then start to go on automatic pilot and you are moving and thinking as one, you know, you're both feeding off of each other. Um, yeah, and, and so, so it's about your colleagues accepting um, that and you know, putting in the additional support that you might need. So kind of helping you to use your dog to get to a chair um, you know, in a room, giving you the verbal information so that you can then uh, give your dog a clue as to where you want to, to go in the room. Um, and it, I've always found my colleagues absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, because dogs, yeah, they are trained um, and certainly my dogs have understood when it's a, um, yeah, so I have, have sat on um, boards of NHS organisations and my dog has understood. It's very formal. You arrive at the table, you sit down, you, you, the dog vanishes under the table in seconds. They're then quiet. 
during the whole meeting, um, you know, unless there's a coffee break or, or whatever, which is very different from a, a team meeting where you know, maybe I've called my team together and we're all just sat on chairs around a circle. Um, and yeah, my God, dog will be saying hello to the folk that are closest um, and, and being a little bit more mischievous, but they kind of twig the differences. Or if I have a, a, a meeting of bringing um, patients and relatives in you know, to, to talk through, um, yeah, again, you know, they'll kind of understand the differences but work colleagues are really, really important, you know, with that. And, you know, and yes, they've, they, um, you know, in, in slightly less formal than board meetings, you know, they'll understand that might all be crowded around the table and they've probably got a dog lying on their feet because, you know, that's, that's the room limitation and actually will be really understanding of that and not make a thing about it. Um, and the fact that they've probably got hair all over their, their new uh, great in striped suit um, <laughs> uh, oh and, Mickey and, I love that I absolutely love that like I just would never conceptualize that and one of the things I want to add on to that is do the doggies ever have like down days like doggy down days like because they're working all the time at work and what do you do if your guide dog's ill and what reasonable adjustment like would you need to take annual leave or sick leave yourself or do you get uh, I don't know do you just get additional days like how how do you do it maybe come into Mandy yeah. first and then Carrie and then Vicky give you all a chance to answer well, I've that. I've had different experiences with this really in different jobs um I think my understanding is that, and how I try to explain it, is, get, is kind of going back a bit to Carrie's example of the wheelchair being the mobility aid. You know, if, if somebody's wheelchair had broken down, they wouldn't be expected to be at work. Um, how I've tried to manage stuff, so they, yes, they are sick, and actually you wouldn't want a sick dog in, in, a, in a workplace, would you? You know, that's not appropriate, um, apart from not safe and not fair on the dog either. Um, is that, that working from home is an option if that is, you know, is, if that is an option. Um, I know in pla different places I've worked, I've been able to access special leave. Um, and I know that I um, was lucky enough, let's see, I say lucky enough, lucky enough to have that when I was training with Fable in terms of special leave um, on the grounds that that was a form of rehabilitation. Um, and treatment in lots of ways to kind of improve my quality of life and and working life really um, so yeah I think that would be what I would hope would happen that degree of flexibility um, and some kind of leave policy that would potentially be available in that situation thank you Carrie coming in to you for your experiences mm. So um, I had, well, Amber was um, poorly um, for the best part of a week, um, really quite poorly. And so what the trusted that I was working for, because they didn't have an actual policy, um, they adapted their um, dependence leave policy. So they basically, they classed her as, as my dependent. And then I, I had to be off to look after her, um, if you like, which, which worked okay. Um, but I think if, like uh, Raz was saying yesterday about that anticipatory, you know, and I, I'd worked for the, I'd worked for them for like over a year and a half, and actually it would have been nice if somebody had thought about that beforehand and it had gone into place rather than then when Amber was really poorly, I was the one then ringing HR going, well my guide dog's sick and I don't know what I can, you know, I obviously I couldn't leave her, um, and yeah, it it's just that anticipatory thing I think just people being prepared I am as a manager I absolutely think that that is the right thing dependent dependent leave it's like carers leave but not carers leave it's their special mm. it's and it's pre-planned it's to say okay you don't need to stress because it's going to be really stressful if your assistant dog your guide dog is actually not able to work so don't stress we'll cover it you won't need to take your valuable annual leave so I've definitely learned something there as a manager. Thank you. And Vicky, coming to you, back to you, please. Um, I, gosh, I had slightly the reverse problem. I, um, 
I accidentally took the wrong dog to work one day. Um, Houston and I had been working until 10 o'clock. We'd, we'd been uh, doing a presentation that evening and the following day, clearly I didn't quite have my head screwed on. And when I grabbed the lead, um, my retired dog clearly bounded forward and got between me and Houston and I popped the lead onto him. Uh, my, my taxi arrived shot into the taxi, got to work, and it wasn't until I got out the, 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 the taxi and put the harness on my retired dog and thought, oh, this feels a bit odd. And then four paces later, we were in a bush, and apparently he looked like a rabbit trapped in the headlights. And uh, I then got a phone call 20 minutes later from my partner, who then said, the only words he said was, you idiot. And uh, we reckon Houston wanted a duvet day. So, um, so we think he agreed to do a swap with my retired dog. We think it, it, it was a, you know, a, a combination between the two of them. They'd had a conversation. Yeah, yeah, you want to do their day, I'll go to work instead. Um, but my husband then arrived half an hour later with a very disgruntled Houston who clearly had been a little bit upset about me shutting the door in his face. <laughs> Didn't quite understand what the heck had gone wrong. Oh, I love those stories. I know, I bet you did probably feel a little bit heartbroken. That is as left. My husband got home to find him there half an hour later. Oh, bless. And I think it's maybe just not being maybe used to not having you there and some, some description, whether it be working or not working. It must be quite a, a bond like no other. I mean, the bond between, you know, some, an owner and their pet is really quite incredible. So actually having that additional bond and you know I don't want to dwell on this but this kind of has moved on mainly because I just feel like a burst into tears and, then, and they certainly don't lose it when they retire which, which was the issue with my retired dog he still wanted to go to work with me and yeah took his opportunity didn't know what to do with it when he got it but he took his opportunity <laughs> Oh, and I mean, so we both went to retirement and then, um, you know, and I know Vicky, you're the only one, Carrie and Mandy are on the first guide dogs and are still going strong. But what is what is the average like working age of a guide dog and how do you know that they're then at retirement age? So, um, so guide dogs are just like people. Um, and I tend to, to, to liken it. So as, so when they reach about nine, um, so they can carry on working later, but any, you know, um, uh, around nine. And it's a little bit like, a, you know, if a taxi goes to pick up a, 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 a very elderly lady, um, you know, and, and they'll go and pick her up and it's, oh, did I lock the door? Oh, did I pick, have I got my bag? Or oh, can you take, what, oh, does my bag need to go? a guide dog will start to do the, the same thing. I can remember see, um, you know, taxis. Oh, you want this taxi? Oh, you want to go into this taxi? Yeah, you really want to go? Into yes, I really do want to go into this taxi. They kind of become a little bit dithery um, and they process information a little bit slower and they walk a little bit slower. But you love them to bits. So you just cope with that for as long as you can until it gets to a point where it's not safe for you. And it's not safe for them. Um, and then when they do retire, they, you know, they, they, they actually do love that. You know, they can go out for walks. You can get friends to come in or, uh, you know, for people that are living on their own um, uh, or, or nobody's at home during the day, then, um, you know, uh, very often guide dog, a guide dog will go back to its puppy walker or you've got close friends that have looked after uh, the dog often say you know my dogs have always ended up with a timeshare family and they spend almost as much time with their timeshare family as they do with us and they're, they're happy with both um you know so finding homes isn't an issue to be honest it's it's more of a problem for the guide dog owner letting letting uh, go of their dog than it is for the dog going or if you are able to keep your dog then you know, then that's that's a luxury that's a luxury I've, luckily I've had that's lovely thank you now I'm going to start wrapping up but what I do want is everyone to just come around to everyone and give everyone the opportunity to talk 
about something that we haven't covered or anything else you want to add maybe how people can be supportive um, of guide dog owners especially in the workplace um, but uh, one of the points I really want to make is a guide dog is so much more than a guide dog it's the psychological the social the emotion the physical support that guide dog brings and it never ceases to amaze me that Guy Jog is 100% charity funded and it relies on donations and fundraising. So uh, I never do this on the podcast, but we are recording right close to Christmas um, and what a year we've had. So if anyone did feel like they could donate to the Guy Dog Trust, uh, Guy Dog Trust, is it, or the association? Mm-hmm. I'll I'll put a link on the um, on the podcast and um, that would be greatly appreciated you know price of a cup of coffee because I just cannot understand how people could you know live a life like all of these three panel members do without guide dogs and you know just raising money is really an important part of that and raising awareness so Thank you so much for considering that. So who wants to go first? Who wants to be the first to start rounding us up? Go on then, I'll start. (laughs) I'll start. Um, I guess I just want to say really, in terms of Fable, I think the biggest thing that she has given me in terms of my personal life and my professional working life is choices. Um, I can now choose to go out for a walk when I want to. I can choose to go shopping when I want to. I don't have to wait for someone to give me a lift or come with me. I can choose a job based on the job that I want to do rather than thinking about, can I get there in a taxi? Is it close enough? How will I get there? Um, And I guess I would um, also just say for her fable, she'd probably help me accept my disability. We talked about that a bit in the last podcast. I think, I don't think I had really fully accepted myself and my disability and my eyesight before I had her. So she has been definitely a life changer. Thank you. Um, Carrie, can I come to you next? So yeah, I'm I'm with Mandy. I think I I hadn't accepted my sight loss until I got Amber and um, she's just been, she's just been amazing. Can't really talk about it without getting emotional to be honest, because Oh, yeah, no, she's just given me so much. I can't even sort of, can't even put into words how amazing she is. Oh, God, I just well up just thinking about it. Honestly, Carrie, I really do. <laughs> Sorry. Like when, we started, when we started to think about, you know, the guide dogs retiring and then passing away I was like oh my god I literally can't cope I could literally just burst into tears so uh, I hear you and you know just them um, pictures I think just really help to personalize and bring it to life for people so thank you and I'm sure you're a wonderful owner I'm sure she loves, loves <laughs> <the pieces. laughs> um Vicky to finish thanks so I suppose reiterate the same as as the others um it's about freedom and uh, when uh, Zeke was needing to retire and uh, was struggling, I was having to, it was impacting on work. I was having to change what I could do at work. It was impacting on my social life. I, I sail, I couldn't get to events. I was having to make decisions and decisions to not do things. So then when Houston came along, you know, I literally got my freedom back. And it is about, it, it is literally about having freedom. And the world can be a very, very scary place. You know, a lot of visually impaired people, um, you know, uh, uh, are concerned about you know, walking outside of their house on their own. And it is a guide dog that makes the difference to that because with a guide dog that takes that scariness away. Thank you so much. And on that note, Thanks to all of you guys. You've been amazing. Really blessed to share this space space with you and learn so much. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Rachel.